Um, so um, my, my training before architecture school was in painting and drawing and sculpture. And so uh, my whole life, I've really been fascinated with light and material and how it creates a mood and emotion. And my, my beginnings were really on the Pacific coast. I, I grew up in Long Beach and Newport Beach. And I've always been interested in this, this atmospheric quality of ambient light. And at the seashore, it goes, it goes from foggy to, to brilliant sun. And I, I particularly like the, the, the times where it was foggy because it makes, it makes these uh, nuance and layered spaces and creates drama and mystery. what's going on and there's a sense of mystery and then <clears throat> in uh, just a quick question are you trying to move your slides or are we still on the title page light and material mood and emotion I, i'm showing slides they're not coming through no <clears throat> not right. sure that the, so that the presenter mode works with zoom presentation mode doesn't work on this i guess i don't believe so I've tried it before and it didn't seem to work for me. All right, so here we go. Take three. Uh, so, okay, here we go. It'll work. Yeah. Uh, start here. Uh, again, um, very interested in light and material, mood and emotion. And uh, next slide is, is uh, the seashore and the fog coming in at the seashore and how that creates drama and mystery. And I've always, I've always really appreciated things where there's a, a discovery process to find out what's going on. And then uh, around high school time, I moved to Arizona and uh, with my family and things became very different. The ambient light was very, very clear and the sun was shining almost all the time, except for the rainstorms. And it <clears throat> makes a stark contrast to um, everything. Shadows are much stronger. Uh, the nights are starry nights. So it's, it's a very, very different kind of experience in the desert. So that had a profound effect on me. And um, it got me very interested in how And uh, I've always been interested in, in um, the quality of material in sunlight. And uh, Louis Kahn actually called this uh, spent light. So he, he, be he believed that the light and material were, were linked together. And, and so do I, I believe that. So this is a project by Richard and Bauer. of how copper just is resonating in the sunlight. And then <clears throat> through, through study of architecture, I've, I've been very interested in, you know, architects that were painters and, and uh, were very interested in, in the uh, texture and the quality of materials. And one of my favorites was uh, Le Corbusier because he was a painter and he understood the idea of surface texture and shadow composition. And uh, to this day, I'm still influenced by Corbu's work and um, his understanding of, of uh, form and material. And then the other part of light that's really interesting is when um, light moves through a material and becomes um, uh, a translucent quality and, and it starts to refract in some way. And I've been very interested in that. Um, the slide on the left is Herzog and Demurian's project in Tokyo, where they, they use this, this glass that bends the light. The project on the right is actually a student project from Cal Poly where they were experimenting with uh, the quality of light coming through glass in a very, very, um, um, interesting little sculpture. 
And in going to uh, painting and art school at Arizona State, um, I was very interested in how light actually interacts with people and with space. And, and to this day, I, I really believe that um, the mood and the, the feelings that we get of where we are is affected by uh, what the quality of light and material is in a, in a particular space. And I, I got this, I got this um, kind of um, understanding by looking at paintings through the, through the early part of my career. And I finally started off in architecture after studying art for a year. And then just like that Rembrandt painting we were just looking at, <clears throat> Corbu's uh, chapel at La Tourette is also very dramatic in the way that it brings light in and starts to render the space. And it actually makes uh, a, a similar kind of drama as that painting that we just saw. And to me, that's, that's a, a really special thing when light comes in a very, in a very controlled and, and beautiful way into a space. Uh, also at La Tourette, the, uh, the way light can come in and it's actually gone through a, um, a lens of color. So it starts to project the color as well as uh, the texture and material. Um, this, is, this is Corbu's palette, a very simple palette, but when it's rendered in light, it gets to be very rich and diverse and, and beautiful. So Corbu talked about um, the masses in sunlight and how, how beautifully they can, they can be composed in sunlight. And so here's um, a facade that's actually a symphony of, of light and shadow and, and the way that it makes forms at La Tourette. I'm sorry, at Rochamp, not La Tourette. And then inside Rochamp, it's, it's a, an amazing experience where you know, you, you uh, get this mood and quality from the light that comes through that wall. And it takes you a while to acclimate to the space when you're there, but it's, it's very, very dramatic in the way that light um, creates that, that profound um, kind of feeling in the space. It's similar to great works of art and music. And in some ways it's even more profound because it activates all of your senses when you're here. Um, another one of my favorites is the Kimball Museum by Louis Kahn and the way that it brings light into the space on the surface of concrete and it tends to dematerialize the concrete and, and transform it into another kind of material. It doesn't look like concrete much anymore when you're, when you're in the space. And um, it just brings a beautiful quality of light into the space and, and uh, renders all of the sculptures in a very interesting way. So um, the other important thing for us is um, finding the intentions and the spirit of a project. And we, when we start a commission, we, we really try to talk about this a lot in our office. It really becomes the, the story of the project and we, we like to um, develop those stories as we're working on our projects. And some examples, uh, these are not ours, um, but this is uh, uh, Alvaro Siza's project, but it, it's an interesting story. Um, and I'll get to some of our stories later, but um, this project had a very tight budget and they wanted to do these pools that are right on the coast next to uh, Porto in, in Portugal. So they, they actually came up with this concept of construction by man um, intersecting nature. And so it really makes this contrast of, of built form and nature, but it's done in a way that's not heavy handed. There's, there's uh, only so much of it here. And that was, that was regulated by the budget. And so it's an interesting story in a very, very beautiful place. If you ever get a chance to go there. Uh, another one that's really interesting is um, 
uh, Peter Zumthor's uh, Vols Baths that uh, really create a profound experience. And it's all about uh, the story of the ritual of bathing in, in a sequence of spaces. Um, so there's social interaction as well as um, you, you sense all these, these materials and uh, different temperatures of water, different scents of, in the water, uh, different light quality. So as you go through these baths, you really, it really awakens all of your senses and your um, understanding of, of where you are. And it's a, it's a very, very great experience to go here. If you haven't been here, try to go, go here. It's in Switzerland. Um, you all are familiar with Salk and how beautiful that place is. Again, it's, it's um, really amplifying the conditions that are around it. It's, it's, um, it's taking advantage of the, the quality of light from the sun and the orientation to the ocean. Uh, warm light is, is orchestrated through all the spaces. Uh, it has a cloistered kind of quality to it that um, really speaks to this idea of creativity and and intellectual thought. Uh, and the, the project is really, uh, even though it looks symmetrical, it's really not symmetrical. There's, there's variations on each side of this building that are very interesting. And they all have um, a reason and, and um, a profound reason. Another really great project. I'm sure all, most of you have seen this, this building. So another thing that's, that's really important for us is this idea of making things. We, we enjoy making things in our office and we enjoy the idea that you're putting spirit into something when you make it. So um, another one of uh, Peter Zumthor's projects, this is um, a, a little chapel in Switzerland, but what, what we really love about this project is it reveals how it was made the structure is all visible and all the joinery of materials is beautifully done. There's a high level of craft in this project and it's all there for you to see and, and uh, perceive. And I love the way the sun comes in and, and celebrates all of that, all of those materials. Um, Carlos Scarpa is another one of our favorite architects in our firm. And so this is a stair, but it's also a beautifully crafted piece of architecture. It's, it's, um, it, it's the experience of moving up and down through space, but when you look at all the elements of this and how it's, how it's made and how refined all the details is, it's really, it's really lovingly done. And uh, so we appreciate that about, about that stair. And a lot of Scarpa's work is that way. There's, there are moments where things are beautifully detailed and you really appreciate that when you, when you walk around his buildings. Um, this is straying away from architecture a little bit, but my, my definition of architecture is pretty broad. So here's a Ducati engine um, from the 1970s and, and look at how beautifully that is put together. That's cast aluminum. Uh, all the materials are polished to a certain level, but not, you know, every, everything has its level of texture and reflection. And it's a beautiful composition. And, and yet it's, it's a machine. It's, it's really a beautiful thing. So the other thing that we're really interested in, 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 um, you know, just as, topics in the office and things that we, that we care about. And that's this idea of orchestrating spatial experience. And when I say spatial experience, I really mean everything that comes along with it. The light, the light quality, the acoustic quality, um, texture, all of those, all of those things that you experience when you, when you uh, visit a work of architecture. We're interested in that. Uh, again, back to one of our favorites, Le Corbusier um, at uh, Villa Savoy. There was um, very simple volumes here, 
but the way that you actually move through this building is pretty complex, actually. The, the movement um, up, up through the spaces and the way that you can roam through these volumes is, is uh, really, really masterfully orchestrated, and, and it is complex. Um, I had a student that actually did a uh, path study of the inside of Villa Savoy, and, and this is what it is. And it's, it's, it, it's a really interesting thing of, all, of how you move through the space and how all the spaces reveal themselves. And spaces uh, are dynamic as you move through them because you get the sense of, of uh, various perspectives. And then when you arrive, there are things that are framed. So views are framed and, and emphasized. So it's, it's really masterfully done. It, you know, it's no accident that so many architects have studied this building and, and tried to understand it. And um, it's really, it's really something. So another piece for us is the sense of place. So we think that um, sites are a very important part of how we, how we understand the architecture. We think that the, the site and the architecture have to weave together. Uh, conceptually, there has to be some kind of a connection and dialogue between the site and, and, and a work of architecture. And many times we're inspired right from the start by the site. The site communicates a lot to us when we, when we start. And generally speaking, we like to try to go to the site and stay there overnight or, or for even for a few days if we can, just to understand the ambient light uh, what is what is the landscape like nearby? Um, is there is there animals? Is there flora and fauna? What's what's going on there? Right. If it's in a city, we look at the city environment. And then, um, if it's a, if it's a place that's been uh, used by people, we'd like to understand. Okay, how have people been using the site? And uh, what is this interaction between people and the site? And we take note of that. Another thing that we like to do is we like to sketch. When we, when we start studying sites, we like to sketch. And we try to understand through the sketches, uh, what are we seeing? What is the spirit of the place? Um, what, is, what is inspirational about the place? So we do a lot of this through sketching. And I particularly like to do watercolors when, when I'm studying uh, a place, because I like to know um, what the sky is like. I like to know how the sun, how, how strong the sun is shining. Um, you know, is it, is it a very, very um, uh, deep kind of shadow that's happening? Or is it a more subdued, uh, foggy, foggy kind of place? You know, those things make a huge difference in the way that we think about our architecture. And uh, watercolors are really quick, and you can start to understand what's going on with watercolors. So here's, here's a couple of versions, or a single version, I should say, of a watercolor. The other thing we like to do is we like to photograph, uh, especially people, if, if, they're, if we're working in a in a, a culture or a, a city or even a suburban area, we like to go out with our camera and we like to try to capture the, the culture that's going on uh, near the place that we're, we're doing our work. And this goes to uh, community outreach, which we think is very important. We, we think the community has a lot to say uh, and, and a lot of good ideas about whatever project it is that we're working on. So we do a lot of community outreach in the work that we do. And then we encourage all of our staff to uh, do sketches. We, we, we ask all of our staff to keep a notebook and we ask them to sketch all the time, even if, even if they're really messy, um, very conceptual sketches. We think they're, they're important because they're, they're usually a, a a conversation that starts with, around a sketch. So we like, we like to do this. 
quite a bit in our office. Another thing that's important to us is this idea of the aesthetic of utility. And there's some great examples. Uh, one of my favorite examples is the Wright brothers and the first airplane. Um, well, they, they were not the first airplane, but they were the first controllable airplane. And uh, they did this through experimentation. But what's beautiful about their, their pieces that they developed is that they're all very essential. There's no, there's no um, superficial um, elements to the things that they created. And I, th I think that's wonderful. Almost like the bicycle is the same thing. The bicycle is a, a very essential design. Um, there's not a lot of, of superficial things related to bicycles. They're, they're very, very efficient and very beautiful because they're util utilitarian in, in their approach. And if, and if we apply this to architecture, um, we, we tend to like uh, spaces that have been done in a way that's, that's very functional. Um, for example, this, this is a building that is a factory and it needed um, natural light to come in uh, and it needed to be very durable. So it's built out of durable materials and um, it's, it's very functional. And we, we tend to gravitate towards these uh, very essential kinds of, of approaches to architecture. And a lot of times that has to do with the budget. We, we don't usually get a huge budget on our projects. So with all of that said, let's talk a little bit about our firm. Uh, we were headquartered in, in San Diego and we have um, offices in Ventura and San Luis Obispo. And we have a sister office in Osaka, Japan. And that's from uh, mainly from my two partners that are from Japan. Uh, and my wife is from Hong Kong. And, and we have people really from, from many parts of the world in our office, from Europe and from South America. Uh, it's, it's a pretty international office. And we like that diversity very much. And so I have been talking a little bit about what influences us, but here's, here's our kind of a summary of our design approach. We, we like engaging history, culture, place, and climate. We like to understand those things uh, when we get assigned uh, a site or, or a location. Uh, we like to start constructing a narrative of intentions, in other words, a story of the project. Engage, engage the people and respect their vision. And, and many times this is not just the client, but the community and what the community has in mind. Um, this idea of poetic is really getting to the essence. What is, what is the essential thing that's, that the project is doing? Um, orchestrating the spatial experience, like we talked about earlier, what, what is that, that quality of arriving and moving through the building? And then finally, uh, last but not least, the emotive use of light, material, space, and craft. Those things are really, really important to us. And hopefully you're going to see that in the work. So now I'm going to present the work. Hopefully it it uh, starts to show some of this, the same ideas. So this is a house in, in uh, Palm Springs um, that's in the design mode right now. And the concept behind it is a line in the desert. And the, the idea of the line is um, it essentially is um, very, very small exposure on the east and west and uh, a lot of exposure to the south, which is the view, and to the north, um, which is uh, where it's going to get its light from. So the one of the ideas that we had is the house is very narrow in its in its um, in its organization, um, and it as soon as it it's outside the the perimeter of the building, we're, we're sort of leaving the desert floor alone. 
So it's, it's making kind of a minimal intervention on the, on the desert flora and fauna. Um, so it controls the light through walls and through overhangs and through uh, various features on the, on the building. And controlling that light is very important. And the program is really the sleeping is on the um, on the right side over here. The living is in the middle, and the pool is at the end. And the breezes actually come from the west, and the pool actually uh, has spray that cools the air from the west and and allows it to come through the building and cools down the building. Uh, one of the things that we do um, in our office is we build uh, very, very large models. So this is the model of the house that we've taken out to the actual site and we've looked at it and see how it's performing with the sun on the site and how it's actually working with the views on the site. So that's a house. And then let's talk about La Jolla Shores Lifeguard Station. So this was completed about four years ago, La Jolla Shores, and it's right there next to the park in, in La Jolla Shores. And it replaced that little building, that's that white building that's in this photograph here. And the, um, the idea of this was to make a uh, open stair and a very minimal um, intervention up into the air because so many so many people in the neighborhood look out over the top of this of this building so we wanted to minimize the visual obstruction for the neighbors up on the hill so essentially this is a stair that's cantilevered and a, and a space for the lifeguards to view at the top and then um, quick response uh, from the building out to to save people as well So the way the plan is organized, there's this central space that's open that allows you to uh, get out quickly to the, to the sand and to rescue. Um, there's the, the left side of the plan, which is actually the lifeguards um, day room and their changing area. So it's essentially their private area. And the, uh, the left side of the of the plan is the, um, the community space. So there's a community room and a place to um, treat people that have been stung by stingrays and that sort of thing. So it's like a little medical facility there. Whoops. Kind of went fast forward on me. Sorry, everybody. I gotta get, I gotta get this thing on the right one here. Okay, now we're on the right one. Um, so probably you're all wondering, how does, how does that, that um, part of the lifeguard tower cantilever out? What's, what's the structure? How does that work? Well, the way that works is there's this arm that, that has a lot of rebar in it and it goes down and, it, and the rebar continues into this mat foundation. So this, this heavy mat foundation actually balances this this arm from turning over and then we we hid this column actually right here so there's another vertical support right here that's that's built into the wall but in reality you sort of read this in the building so that's how it works and the other thing that this lifeguard tower does is it actually makes a gateway when you're when you're walking along la jolla shores the boardwalk there it makes a point where you actually enter into that that uh, part of the beach where most everybody uses it so it, it is a gateway structure um, another project that we did is the nix nature center in laguna hills and um, this this was a very interesting interesting assignment so this nature center is actually to study the geography, history, and ecology of the Laguna Hills area. And so we started off by uh, looking at the site 
in the site is actually part of the Laguna Coast Wilderness Park. So that was a very important thing for us to understand um, the flora and fauna and the uh, natural constraints of the site. So we did this diagram to try to understand the views from the site and how the site actually connects to a trail that already existed. So in reality, our, our center really becomes part of the trail and part of the overall experience of arrival and, and moving into the park. We really encourage these kind of diagrams where you really try to understand where your views are and, and how you access and, and um, you know, how, how you actually engage the, um, the attributes of the site. So the plan is a pretty simple plan. On the right side is the exhibit spaces and on the left side is the rangers um, uh, private area. So the rangers actually are the caretakers of, of the uh, trails and, and they look after um, all the visitors, that sort of thing. And um, the, the, this pier-like structure that goes out over the meadow is actually a painting porch. Uh, there's plain air painters that come and actually do painting on the end of this porch. And then as you come up on, the, on this uh, decomposed granite sloping walk, this actually is how you start on the trail. You come up here, you can actually go onto the trail off this way or out this way. Uh, this is a section, uh, this is a rammed earth wall here on the south side with an overhang that shades it during the summertime and allows the sun to hit it in the wintertime. And this is actually a operable skylight and allows the warm air to escape here. And on the north side, there's um, nothing but view out to the wilderness. These are little sketches that I did kind of early in the game that sort of were studies of how, what the experience was gonna be like, how you were gonna actually arrive and, and move through this labyrinth and experience things along the way. So this was sort of a experiential uh, discovery sketch. Here's the project. It sits in the meadow. It kind of floats above the meadow. Here's this incline walk that comes up to the entry. And our idea here was for people to actually feel the concrete um, and use their hands and sort of, of uh, experience the materiality of the building as they come up to, to the building. And it's not really clear where the entry is. So you're kind of in this discovery mode as you move up this ramp. Then finally, you, you come to the entry. Uh, we were after these, these kind of unexpected light experiences where we're squeezing light uh, through a very, very, very narrow kind of a space and illuminating the materials. Um, we played a lot with reflection of light. Uh, inside, we have, we have spaces that are lit in a very mysterious ways. Uh, and some of them are intentionally dark because we, we show slides on those walls. And so this is really a labyrinth of walking past um, um, the, the rammed earth walls and um, feeling the experience of the rammed earth wall from, from inside and also from the outside. And then our exterior spaces were really kind of more of the same. We, we took the same materiality and brought them out into the courtyards. So that's, that's also the uh, board form concrete. And um, that's decomposed granite from the site. And the rammed earth is actually this same material is, is in the wall. So we use, we use the decomposed granite from the site for these courtyards and then we used it in, in the rammed earth walls. Another one of our projects we just finished is the Borrego Springs Library. Um, maybe some of you have seen this. 
uh, was it was published here pretty recently. So that's the floor of the Borrego Springs area, the floor of the desert. And um, our project is is a spur off the main circle of of uh, Borrego Springs. So it's it the Borrego Springs is right at the foot of these very dramatic mountains. It's an incredibly beautiful site. So this is our site before before the building was on it, and you can see uh, how dramatic those mountains are. Amazing. And uh, so we stayed there at Borrego Springs for about uh, five or six days, and and uh, we started capturing things that were inspiration for the project. So the the desert floor with the blooming, uh, the night sky with the Milky Way. Uh, these are petroglyphs that are are um, a couple of thousand years old that are there. And then there was an artist that's been that's been working. Lots of artists have been working on the desert floor there, and this was one of them that that we got really interested in. So this is our site plan. Uh, the library is here, and this is a park that that's still being developed, and the park. Uh, weaves together with the library with this long axis that goes out through the space. Along this axis is actually a, a model of the solar system, starting with the sun here and the planets are markers on, on the uh, ground plane that go out through the, the site. And this is um, the dog part uh, at the end uh, and Pluto Pluto the, is right there in the center. Um, some of our sketches along the way that we did uh, developing the, the concepts, and this, this was a model that we actually took out to the site and we, we um, actually designed a lot of the, the things that happen with overhangs with this model on the site. And then along the way we developed uh, the project in Revit. And what we like to do a lot in our office is take, take um, digital models and actually draw um, with pastel over digital models to try to understand how landscape might work and how other elements might work and, and what the color scheme and the materiality scheme might be. So we, we tend to work by hand and then also digitally too at the same time. Uh, this is the later, the later model of the, of the library that we took out to the site. And then here's the, the um, actual building. And it's still, it's still rusting. Um, and it's, it's getting to the point now where it's not going to rust much more. It's kind of sealed, sealed itself. So that's core 10 steel that we used. And these are some of the internal spaces. The, um, the spaces are oriented so that you really feel like you're hovering above the desert floor. So when it, when it actually blooms and you look out these windows, you're gonna see all the, the bloom. Uh, that's really, really pretty magnificent. And uh, the, the building at night was very important to us. So we, we simulated it a lot at night as we were designing it. Another one of our projects, um, this was a competition we did with Cal Poly students. Uh, and this was a cruise ship terminal in Taiwan. This, this uh, competition, I think, goes back to about 2010, I think. And so our thought was the sculptural event on, on the harbor edge. Uh, uh, but all, these, all of these elements are very, very functional. And one of the thoughts we had was the building produces a lot of water um, coming off the roof because it, it, there's a lot of rain and condensation at, at Kaohsiung Harbor. And so the idea was to take that water and pull it into uh, gardens, water gardens. So off to each side of the building are these uh, seasonal water gardens that are, are very um, sensual and and um, experiential, and that brings you to the building. 
And the spaces inside, we, we thought it would be nice to try to orchestrate uh, very dynamic kinds of interaction between people. So you could be at different levels and see other people. Um, so we like, we like doing these, these kinds of spaces where everybody can see each other and, and you have this kind of drama going on with all different kinds of viewpoints of people. And that kind of continues on into the commercial part of the building, which is this portion here. And then outside, um, this part of, of, uh, of the harbor um, is kind of quiet right now. And we thought that this building could really liven it up. So we came up with this idea of LED media um, in the glass facing, facing the, the uh, commercial street edge on the, on the other side of the bay. And so that's what this is. So it's intended to be a beacon and a lantern at, at night as well. Um, this is a cross section kind of showing the structure and how it actually works with the ships. Um, the, red, the red level is people um, uh, on the concourse. Uh, red, red in the center is the atrium. Uh, the green is the port off office building. And then this shows the sustainability ideas. We, we developed these with uh, the firm called Bureau Happel, which is a, a, a firm that originated in Europe that is worldwide now and um, really, really great to work with. So these are some of the strategies in terms of regulating the light um, and uh, shading the building, self-shading the building, and then capturing the water that comes from the building. And uh, this is a daytime, daytime view of the building, what it's like. Um, this is a project that we've been working on for the last, um, well, it's, it's been finished for about three years, but it took us about nine years to do the, the, this project. And this was the City College expansion to the Southeast, San Diego City College and the site probably you all know it, the site is over here, very, very important part of San Diego right here. And so um, our site was on the southeast corner and connecting to the IDEA district. So one of the things that was very important to us was to make these very strong connections out to the sidewalk and, and the public realm so that it's easy to move to East Village uh, so uh, this is the, the um, Arts and Humanities building here, and this is the Business Technology building, and it forms a quad. And this is the Math and Social Science building and a parking structure. Uh, and then this is a remodel that we did up here of one of the existing um, buildings from the 1960s. So essentially, it's all, all of this that we worked on. Very, very honored to have done this project. This was, this was like three blocks of downtown that we, we got to work on, which is kind of amazing for any architect in their career. So we, we were very blessed to be able to do this. So here's some, some of the moments. I'm not gonna try to explain it all as there's a lot, there's a lot here. Um, but capture, captured some of the moments of the, of the place for you to see. This was important, this corner here, because this is where, where people come to um, uh, City College. If you're, if you're in East Village, this is probably the entry that you're going to use if you're coming from East Village. And so we, we developed this corner entry. And we used, um, because, because our budget was, was constrained, we used some uh, pretty interesting construction technology. So this is actually um, built like a parking structure, except it's glazed. Um, so it's, it's uh, uh, precast columns and, and beams and, um, precast tees 
that are, um, all of these are brought in and placed. And then uh, the shear walls are cast and placed concrete. So we have various forms of concrete that we handled it, uh, all of them a little bit differently in their texture and their and the way that they were rendered in the in the building. Uh, this is the main courtyard that's activated by um, the large uh, lecture halls. The, there's um, a cafeteria that opens out into the space and there's a gallery. So all of all of that is kind of like public public interaction. And we really viewed this courtyard as a, as an extension of the city public realm right into the into the campus. Uh, this was the art classroom uh, during the day and during the night, and it's used it's used um, both times. Uh, gallery that's open to the public, so they they uh, they have lots of exhibits here that and the public comes and and sees these exhibits. And then in the classrooms and the, and the uh, corridors, we thought it would be really interesting to put some, some materiality that really gives um, some sensation moving through the building so that that wood sort of communicates on, a, on, on the, you know, your eyes and your touch and the walls have uh, are very smooth in some places and then rougher in other places so there's there's color that pops here and there so it really kind of makes a um, a whole kaleidoscope of of um, experiences in terms of acoustics and touch and feel and and sight inside of this building and uh, this is the construction system and it's it's very it's very very economical because it's how they build parking structures. And this was the sustainability strategy. So we have uh, something called displacement ventilation in this building that, that uh, is very, a very efficient way to cool the building. Uh, we also have um, control of the sun on the south side. Those, those overhangs are actually the, the T members projecting out through the through the plane of the glass and they shade, they shade the glass at the right time of the year. And the corridors are not conditioned in this building. They're all naturally ventilated. So when you, when you consider that probably 30% of the building is corridor, that means we're, we're saving 30% of the energy because it's, it's not um, conditioned by the uh, AC system or the heating and the cooling system. I should say. And we are also capturing the water from this building and storing it. So that's another, another thing that we're doing. And this is the last one I'm going to show. It's Wilson Middle School. And it's something that we're working on right now. And it's under construction. And it's, um, it's part of a elementary school and a middle school on, on one site that, that we've been working on for the last seven years. And it's a very urban development. This, this is three stories here. This is um, a parking structure that's got four levels. So it's, it, you know, it's everything is, is um, kind of an urban kind of um, tightness on the site. So it's kind of like a Rubik's cube, if you will, for, for program and, and space development. So we, we kind of jumped immediately into making models to really understand what we were doing. And this, this building is classroom buildings with, with thermal chimneys that line up here and, and allow the air to, to come through and, um, and ventilate through the classrooms. Uh, this is a photovoltaic array that's here and shades, shades this part of the building. Uh, these are outdoor eating spaces here and a library over here. So we, we developed um, a lot of these landscape spaces at multiple levels. So this is like one level below grade. And with this project, the, the soil was um, contaminated. So we had to dig down 10 feet to get rid of the contaminated soil. So we decided to put the whole music program 10 feet down below. And this is the courtyard that brings light and air into the music program that's down below here. 
Um, and you can see it again here. This is, this is the lower courtyard and then this is the performing arts center here that faces the street. And this is kind of a detail of how the classrooms work. We, we actually found a way to exit um, through, we called the, the, this space a collaboration area and the um, DSA, who is the approval body, allowed us to use this uh, as an adjoining room so we can exit through it. So um, these spaces are actually going to be used. It won't be just a corridor. There'll be um, uh, pull-out classes that will happen out here or little study groups that will happen out here. And then these are the thermal chimneys that go down and, and pull the air through from, from outside into the chimney and then up and out. So it, it forces the ventilation through the classrooms. Some of the renderings. Uh, this is the, the main uh, collaborative area. As you come in where the, where the PV panels are shading the outside and making that covered space, this is just inside of that. This is the collaboration corridor, but we don't call it a corridor because, it, because then we, we can't do all the things that we're doing here. And some construction shots. I'll just kind of buzz through these because I think I've used up my time here. So here's some construction shots. Uh, it's coming along pretty nice. We did this, we did this gigantic mural uh, that, that's really pretty, pretty fun. We, we were very lucky to be able to do that. And we use this diamond block, which really is a, an amazing uh, chameleon kind of thing, because when, depending on where the sun is, it, it turns into the most amazing shadow. Or if the sun is hitting it directly, it, it turns into something very different, very subtle. So it's, it really, it's really a pretty amazing skin. And we used this, and it wasn't really that expensive. It wasn't that much more than a standard concrete block. So that's, that's pretty much the end. Are there any questions, comments? I, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up the ball there, Ralph. Uh, I, I will have to say to, uh, one comment, I guess on both, uh, what was it? The, the lifeguard station in La Jolla and the city college. I mean, not to like, maybe within the last two months, my wife and I have had separate conversations about the architecture of both those two buildings. And it's just amazing to actually meet the architect who actually designed those two uh, beautiful concrete structures. And then my uh, question was, I'm very intrigued myself with sustainable uh, architecture, just with, with, with sustainable environment in, in theory in general. Uh, how does that how does that chimney system work in that middle school at the end? How does that actually, how does that pass the air through the building? I was very intrigued by that. Yeah, so it's, if you, if you would imagine a um, classroom down at the first level and even a classroom at the second level um, with, with windows that automatically open and, and the, I don't know if you noticed those walls were angled so that they they actually catch the westerly breeze, the, the walls into the classroom on the outside, scoop, scoop the westerly breeze. So the breeze comes into the classroom mm -hmm. and the chimney is actually got an element at the top that warms the air at the top of it. So it starts a convection current um, and, and it actually, the, the air starts to rise up that chimney and it pulls the air as it's rising, it's pulling the air through the classroom and up. So it's, it's forcing ventilation through the classroom and, and up and out the chimney at the top. I mean, that is, that is incredible using, using the breeze, yeah, using the angle of the windows. I did, yeah, I did not see that. So no, to, to answer your question, that is quite amazing. That is. And it, and it works. Okay. We, we've been, we've been, you know, doing a punch list on that building. Wow. Uh, yeah, that thing, that thing, actually you could feel the air moving through there and it's, it, it really, it really does cool the space down. I, I guess uh, also, um, 
pop it in my head. What? How did you control? So my parents live out in, in Palm Desert, so I'm very used to that, like white light. How did you? I, I saw like the black. Your, what was the material of walls you used for that home? That 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 the linear home you had out there um, in Palm Springs. It's a uh, it's block. It's concrete block, um, and then we we uh, we're still detailing that, by the way. But what we did on the south side is we made a, um, a, I would call it adaptable overhang. So in, it actually stretches out in the winter time. So if you want to, if you want to control how much sun comes in, you can actually pull pull on that overhang and it's and it's on rails and it can move out, and make more shade. And then in the oh. time you can do the same thing. You can pull it out and make more shade. But it, let's just say it's super cold. Uh, you've got a cold winter morning, right? And you want mm -hmm. want the sun to come in. You can actually pull that thing back, and and it'll stop and allow sun to come in on the south side and warm up warm up the space. Like on a cold morning. Wow. I mean, that's that's awesome. I mean, it just. I don't want to talk too much and take it away from you, Ralph, but that is, control. there is a big play. Uh, you know, my parents basically spend uh, mornings on their, you can say, western side of their house because of the, the sun rising and it's just blinding. But then they spend their evenings on the east side of their home because of the, the sun setting. It's just, it's a one, yeah, sorry. It's just wonderful. <laughs> I'm done. It's it's how you live in the desert, right? And the other thing that happens to you when you live in the desert is you turn into a nocturnal animal, you know. Yeah. I, I lived in Phoenix for eleven years, and it, you 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 shift your you shift your time your socialization to when it's cooler, which is usually, you know, later in the day. Absolutely, G Ralph. Appreciate the, the answers. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a question uh, for you, Ralph. There you go. Yes. You okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm always interested in um, the magnitude of of uh, the work at hand. So the particular um, um, program that you're working with. So you know that radical contrast between the uh, the lifeguard station uh, and uh, the city college campus. And um, my interest in it is, is understanding how you work. Does it change uh, in terms of the dynamic of how you approach it? Or does it, is it pretty much a template? Uh, you know, how, how would you characterize um, how you approach um, varying magnitude? So um, it's a great, that's a really wonderful question. I think each project is, it's, it, we start, we start, um, without too many preconceived ideas. Although, you know, I, I think it's impossible to not have some preconceived ideas, but we try to shed as many of those as possible and then see, see what the project, how the project um, starts to evolve and what, what are the forces and the pressures and, and that start to, you know, like the client has a desire, the community has a desire. You've got a, a site that's, that maybe has got a lot of constraints and that's that's a pressure. So we start start to see what all those things are starting to do. And then somewhere through there, we start getting an idea for a concept of, of space development. Like what, you know, what do we really want to achieve with this project in the way of, of uh, a spatial experience? And so we throw that into the soup and really, it's it's kind of like bridging all of those things. It's bridging the clients, the clients' ideas, the community's ideas, the the needs of the site, uh, the context, which sometimes we we will will talk, try to talk to the context that's around, and sometimes we'll kind of use it as a point of departure, and we'll and we'll kind of we did that at City College because you know those brick buildings by Hope are. Have a have a really distinct language, but we kind of used it as a point of departure for our buildings. Um, so it's it's kind of it's kind of like making a soup, really. And um, 
you know, putting putting the right ingredients into the soup on each project, and, it, and it's not, it's, you know, I'm hoping it's not a formula, you know, uh, I, somebody told me that they can really tell when it's our work, and I hope that doesn't come because it's a formula, you know. <laughs> uh, does that answer your question? <laughs> Well, I, yeah, I'm just uh, trying to understand, you know, your process and how you approach your work. And, you know, I think that's one of the, the um, telltale signs of maybe a process is, is uh, looking at the range of magnitude and uh, asking that serious question, you know, do you approach every project completely different or do you have kind of this uh, um, way of managing that, that uh, is is kind of common to all of your projects and and you know you you speak of a soup and yeah there's there's an approach to making a soup and so so I, I would suppose that would be the same with uh, I think that there's the same topics right like like um, what is what's the culture what's the what's the site what is you know um, what what is the client what's the client's story you know those those things are are the same and they the topics are the same but maybe the the stories are different and need a different expression on each one but the topics are always always the same pretty close to the same i would say and then you're right you know a big project is different than a small project um that's that's very true um you know like we the a life Art tower i think we had a different mindset because we it's more like a, it's more like a piece of furniture than a than a, the city college complex that we did, which is like four buildings, right? So it's all those buildings had to be a little bit different, just you know, for a lot of different reasons. But so handling a smaller project like the lifeguard tower and and doing a complex of three or four buildings is way way different, no question about that. But thanks for sharing that. Yeah. 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 I have a question. Yes. You remind me of all the attraction that architecture has had in my life. And I thank you, you for that. I wish that maybe there will be the opportunity late, later of joining a group of creative people coming with products as beautiful as the ones that you have presented to us. My question is, how did you integrate or disintegrate the ideas coming from different creative sources, working with, a, with an international team, with people with different cultural backgrounds? Who comes and puts together and choose and put together all the potential ideas to address a project, if it is in the desert, at the beach, or working in a pre-existing infrastructure like City College. How can you do that? Who does it? I can imagine how you organize the work, the creative side of the work with a multidisciplinary, maybe multi-national team. How do you do it? Uh, it's not easy, um, but but we, we try. Um, so we, we First of all, we, we make a team and we try to make the team of, of people that are really excited about the project, right? So the first thing is we, we pull the team together inside the office and that's also tricky because schedule has pressures in the office and you have to, you have to kind of make that all work. But once we have a team put together, then, then we start brainstorming and we start uh, sketching and we start drawing we start we use a lot of different media in our office uh, we use little blocks of wood to study things um, uh, you know those models that I showed were were way way later in the game but we a lot of times start with little blocks of wood just to try to figure out what what could really happen but along the way we share the projects with the whole office and that's when we get really interesting critiques like we because we're we're all in this COVID environment we do zoom and we we zoom together with our other offices and it's kind of great now that we we can 
we can zoom with our Ventura and, and San Luis Obispo people and they can they can comment. So we try we try to to do a lot by critique, which is something I really believe in. And you know, I, I still teach for that reason because I I think that's that critical thinking and critical um, discussion is what makes projects better. And they do not come from one source in our office. We there is a principal usually that's conducting, um, but the ideas come from everywhere. They, the, you know, clients, the our staff, our consultants, the community. The, the ideas come from all over the place. Thank you. I think the ivory tower is gone for us anyway. <laughs> I, I would have to maybe agree with the Ralph. Is there anybody else that has any uh, questions or comments? Go on Hi, once. Sorry. Um, sorry for interrupting, Andrew. Um, this there you is, go, Javier. No, go ahead. A question is just like a comment. It's wonderful how uh, within architecture it comes a lot of other uh, topics like physics, like then there's biology even, or uh, building work. For example, the line in the desert building. I think it is wonderful to put uh, the pole on the side where the wind blows to cool the whole house. It's, it, I don't wanna uh, talk too much, but it's just wonderful how those little things contribute a lot to the final product. Um, and I also want to say thank you for uh, spending your time with us and teaching us about all of those things. So uh, I wanna just pile onto that for a second. So I would encourage all of you to study vernacular architecture because a lot of these principles of of how to build and and how to use water to cool um, has been done for for a long long time you know many parts of the world and um, one of the reasons why we like to have people from all over the world in our office is they we learn from them right and they they bring us resources to look at of how 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 to deal with climate in other places right so it's um i would really encourage you guys to to um especially if you're if you're going to practice in san diego and stay in southern california look at other climates that are similar to california and see how they build in their, those climates there's a lot of really interesting um i'm not going to call them answers i'm going to just call them possibilities, you know? Yeah. All right. Um, thank you so much for, again for your amazing lecture. I want to thank everyone else for coming in here and participating with us. Uh, this was our first lecture of uh, our lecture series. We're trying to make it our goal to bring a new vision uh, to our to our members, you know, in community college, it's important to uh, find inspiration, kind of find purpose for students, for future architects, and then we're making it our goal to kind of bring in people with amazing ambition and amazing dedication to come and kind of share with us some of their formulas that they have used in their career. Um, this will be on our website. We will have a recording of this meeting on our website. We we actually just created it on on Wednesday. We finalized it. We're, we haven't updated, but it is Mesa AIAS.org. I'll put that on the. Can I make a request?